So yeah, um, so I will be talking about a, a, a couple of things focusing more on, on what I think is exciting from a modeling perspective and, and might be useful or, or what we might be doing that. Um, and so, so I model biological systems, but there are a couple of things that attract me a lot in these biological systems that I will be talking about here. Um, one of them is shape. And that's the shape of the cell up to the shape of the organ and, and the organism. Um, but also, for example, if you if you look at topology, and topology can be, in this case today, I'll be talking about topology in, in of cells. Um, but also we we often use topology when we look at interaction networks. And, and today I'll be giving a little bit of flavor uh, when we look at interaction networks between um, our biochemical pathways. So um, yeah, so these are the <laughs> <laughs> These are the study notes of this very important um, Japanese um, cartoonist, uh, artist, um, Hokusai. Mm -hmm. And one of his pages, so, so I, I really like these, these things, but one of his pages is um, it's, it's portraying a legend in, in Japan, but this, this legend sort of uh, evolved through whole Asia. Um, it's the, the legend of the white elephant and the monks. So these monks here are blind. And, but every one of them is trying to understand what it is that they're feeling. So they have this white elephant, which is like the reality. And um, because it is so big to them and they can't see it, they can only feel it by touch. And so they, you know, they very precisely are trying to recognize, for example, the tusk or here the, the yeah, the, 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 the nose. And, um, and they will have a very different sense of what this white elephant is. And so in the very end, they come together and they talk about it. And then some ver versions of the story, they say that they fight and they just can't understand each other because they, they can't believe what the other one has perceived. Um, and in some versions of the story, they actually, you know, take a step back and they can piece together the elephants by, you know, putting everybody's experience together. So, so that's a more... Uh, Sorry, Veronica, uh, we can't, we're still seeing your title slide. I don't know if you've moved. Oh yeah, I have. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, that's interesting. Just a second. Um, Great. Might, might need to unshare and share again sometimes. That okay, let's let's try it again. Sorry, thank you for letting me know. Um, let's share. Yeah, it was again. A, a good description, though. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you haven't seen the picture, so this is this is going to be exciting. Do you see it? Do you see it now? Moving. It is uh, still feels slight. Yeah. Oh, okay. So in that case, what I could do. Uh, which is very strange because I'm well. This is like I I I've, I made this with LaTeX, but it's a it's a it's a PDF, and it should be just uh, I'm putting an acro acro read right Control L presentation mode. Do I maybe if I stop share maybe I if I share again I could share my screen. What happens here? And then if I go like this. Uh, sorry. Okay, so but now you see everything, right? Yeah, so it's full screen, but it's still first first slide. Yeah, so you see you see this here in the in the edge, right? Yeah, but it's just black on the end. So yeah. Whatever. Is it okay? Okay. Um, and if I if I change slides, do you do you see yeah, this, or, yeah. or is the bottom disappearing? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, like this. Okay, so so this is the white elephant. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. So 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 the moral of the story, I think, for us when we look at biology is first of all, it's it is way too complex for for you know uh, for us to encapsulate or for us to try to 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 minimize and, and and touch, right? So 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 we have this dilemma. But the other thing is that we have to be conscious that when we do modeling or when we you know we're exper experimentalists are looking at one part of this this beast. Um, it, it's always going to be a glimpse of the reality. And I think that's where a lot of the discussions and lots of the, sometimes the, the problems with trying to get your article published can be, is that people can have very, um, it's not that they're, <laughs> it's not that you're correct or they're wrong, but they can, you know, they can be really focusing on, on something else. And to get out of this, I think uh, one thing is, um, well, my elephant, by the way, in the lab is cell and tissue polarity. So I'll be talking a lot about that. And one way we over, try to overcome this a little bit, though, though we'll never be able to uh, overcome come it, is to use a, a couple of techniques, right? When we, when we look at cell and tissue polarity. So computational modeling is one of them. So we have simulations. 
Um, but we also try to use, when we can, uh, simple mathematical models where we can get an analytic understanding. So, you know, computational models are nice, but sometimes they give you some intuition, but they don't really give you a fulfilling explanation as if you distill it even further and, and try to get some more rigorous maths than you could get. So these things should really much go hand in hand. They also help you uh, debugging your models even, right? And your way of thinking. We also have some experimental approaches that some of the things we do in the lab, a lot of times we just collaborate, which is also really nice, but collaborate in a way where we can even think about how to set up the experiments that would be the best for, for getting the, the data in, in a good way. And, and what I've been working on also in the John Innes Center with, with a grant from a, a EU grant is swarm robotics. So this is the idea of can we now, can we implement these ideas of morphogenesis and patterning in a totally artificial system, yet still behold the same type of uh, general concepts that we see in patterning in, in biology. So this is more like an extrapolation of our insights and a proof of principle that, you know, we can we can work with something artificial, which has noise and has sources of error, but we can still, you know, get complex um, patterns to form. So, what what do I mean by plant and cell, uh, plant cell and, and tissue polarity? Um, well, first of all, if you look at any organism, they're not they're not just a ball, right? They they grow in in sheets, or they grow in 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 certain structures which have which have shape, and that usually results in because there's an anisotropic growth, and that means that there's a polarity of growth, right? So tissues they organize themselves polarly, not only to shape themselves to morph, but also, for example, to send signals or to you know pick up nutrients and things like this. So there's there's a very clear uh, directionality which is being um, which is being regulated in these tissues. But if you look into the cells, which are the building blocks of all these structures, you will see that they also, they're not just, um, and we'll talk about this soon in the next slides, they're not just hexagons, they're not just like bubbles, but they actually can be very active. And this activity from within, these forces from within, they change the shape of the cells. And to understand how do these uh, forces know where to localize and how to morph a single cell, this is what I would call is uh, understanding cell polarity on that level. So, for example, this is a this is Ariridopsis, which is a plant I work with. On the leaf, you see that there are these cells called pavement cells, and they look like jigsaw pieces of a puzzle. Um, and they have highly uh, polarized structures of outgrowth. So they have many, many different fronts. Um, whereas, for example, other cells that we've been working with uh, down here, this is like this pancake here is a keratocyte that lives on the on fish, and um, when it's when it's not polarized, it's just simply round. And when it polarizes due to a gradient or a Q, it gets this sort of banana shape here to the side and it can move, it glides along. So that's a polarity again. Um, so, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how people have been starting to, to look at shapes of cells to try to understand what is happening. What is the cell if we look at its shape? And Darcy Wentworth Thompson, he wrote a book on called On Growth and, and Form about 100 years ago. He's a Scottish a biologist um, in which he was really intrigued by this, this aspect of shape. And he came with a lot of really great hypotheses. So he was talking, he said, like, you know, look at these histological pictures of cells like here in red and look at anything that you can make, for example, with, uh, you know, convection in, in liquid or, or bubbles, like surface tension minimizing um, cellular um, material or, or, or cellular um, compartmentalizations. And you can see that they share lots of properties of having, for example, um, characteristic angles of 120 degrees, of having, you know, if you're not looking at the boundary of having six neighbors, you know, so all these things that you would you would be able to deduce from from um, something which is packing in space and is trying to minimize uh, the, the the perimeter. But he said, but in biology, so he said most of biology can be explained by things as simple as that. So he was the first one to really start saying, you know, biophysics is guiding a lot of the things we see. Um, but he said, well, you know, you have these different cells here from different organisms, um, and this one here is, uh, is Arabidopsis, is the plant that I just showed you. These here are from mollusks. And he says, yeah, they're not really minimizing their surface. They have all this huge perimeter, like what a waste. But he said, for example, in many cases, you can explain it. Um, and he gave an explanation, which I think was, was really cute. So you, you could make a froth with the white of an egg. So you'd have these, these, this froth, these little bubbles. You put it on a stretched rubber, right? Like a 2D sheet. And then when you release that tension, you know, those bubbles, which have now solidified a bit, 
you'll see that they're going to buckle their edges. So you're going to get all these rufflings, which will look very much like, you know, some of those cells he saw. So he even did these things to show that they, they look the same. And, um, and in many of these organisms, it seems that happened indeed. Those cells were expanding on top of a membrane, the membrane would shrink, and then the cells would just get ruffled, right? Um, however, in plants, because plants don't really have these membranes as, as animal cells do, and they actually have cell walls around them, which are really rigid. So you don't really have this contraction being able to explain those shapes. And he also did say that. So he said, I have tried to get this out of here. The more coarsely sinuous outlines of the epithelium of many plants is another story and not so easily accounted for. And this is something that in the last years, we're really getting our, you know, our nails into that system. How do plants actually change their shape? Um, because it's not, it's not like a, a, a froth bubble, you know, many, many people make the comparison, it's more like glass blowing, right? But if you have many, many different uh, outgrowths, then something very complicated is happening on the pattern formation inside the cell. So if people have questions, please, please interrupt. Uh, second. So one of the things we use in the, in the lab, um, so, so forget about the plants for a moment, this is just general. Um, we like to think about uh, cell surface mechanics. So how do you describe or distill a cell into these biophysical terms? Um, if you want to do something like this, so this blue thing is a, is a biological cell. And actually you can, you can talk about an adhesion driven tension of its membrane, right? Um, which would be a term like J, which gives you this magnitude of, of adhesion. P is the perimeter. Of this, of this thing. Um, so these would be the terms which will give rise to the total energy and this energy wants to be, you know, you're going to minimize it to, to find the solution of what the, what the shape is. There's going to be a term which is area conservation, right? So this is just this constraint here with a, with a constraint parameter lambda. Um, a is the actual area and this big A here is a target area. So that's a parameter. So this is a um, for some reason, there's a, there's a given area that this cell desires to have, and it can, it can vary around this, but then you're going to have this quadratic here um, penalty, right? So this is the area conservation term. And there's another term which can be used or not. It's, it's, it's optional, um, though in some cases it has been proven to be necessary, uh, biologically even. It's called the cortical tension, and that's to say that you have that same type of constraint, but for the perimeter, not just for the area, but for the perimeter. So the area conservation has a better, um, a more easy justifiable biological uh, map, which is like the osmotic pressure. Um, and the cortical tension, some cells have it, some don't, but this would be a corresponding to the fact that underneath this very uh, flaccid membrane, which is the plasma membrane, you have a, a cortex, which is like a structure, a, a more rigid structure, like a network of, of filaments, which, which has a decide, which will, keep a desired perimeter or desired surface. Okay, so this is very generic. So this is called cell surface mechanics, right? So, so these are the things that you could assume. In general, you would write it then like, okay, so you'd have your energy function, which um, P and A are, are, are your variables, and these are your parameters that you put in. And this would then be this term. So J times P, perimeter, and then you have lambda P, which is your parameter, right? P minus target perimeter squared, and then lambda a, a, which is the area minus the, the parameter a, the target area squared. Okay, so um, the nice thing is uh, we've been doing a lot, of, a lot of analysis on this simple equation, what, what you can get or not. So what are the solutions what, for different um, combinations of these parameters? Uh, when would you get uh, equilibrium radius? When do these radius collapse to zero, when do you have bistability? So, so you can do the theory on top of this. So it, it's not that you just randomly plug in parameters. You, you can now understand, you know, if you analyze the system, um, what are the possible uh, outcomes? Um, so, so I just wanted to point out that from the standard energy function, you can, you can derive the interfacial tension, which will be the partial derivative of the energy to its perimeter. And um, so you'll, you just, you know, take the derivation of this and you, and you get this type of term, which we call gamma. Um, you can also uh, describe the pressure of that cell, which again is the that derivative in relation to the area minus. So you, you get a, a term here only dependent on area. And you can also calculate out, you know, what would be the force, right? So the force would be here, the gradient of, of that energy. And, and, and we can describe it in terms of, of, uh, of gamma and pressure. Okay, so, so we have this. So when people make a big fuss, uh, oh, you're using an energy-based model and not a force-based model, actually, it, 
you know, you can derive what the forces effectively are here, but we're not explicitly taking them into account. We're looking at the energy. Okay, so now what you can do analysis like with this, but you want to do simulations, especially if you have lots of cells. Um, the, the technique we use, um, it's also, I think, what Bhakti uses a lot and, uh, and, and, and many people that, that we in Bhakti know. It's called the cellular POTS model, okay? Um, and, and basically what we do is we're gonna run, we're gonna run this on, a, on, on the computer and so we're going to um, you know, digitalize cells. So cells will be made out of many, many um, sites, um, which will correspond to one cell. And then we're going to see how the border will evolve over time, given this energy, uh, the cell surface energy. If anybody has a question, please do answer. I'm not really looking at the chat, so you can just interrupt. Um, so this is just a schematic. So this energy function, or sometimes called the Hamiltonian, so it has the adhesion, the volume conservation, the cortical tension that I told you about. But basically, so every little site, the, the, the algorithm will, will take one sigma. Well, first of all, what is the sigma? So every site has, has these numbers, which will number the individual cells. So for example, all the twos here is cell number two, cell number six, 46, seven, four, and so forth. Now these cells can be of uh, different types and those types will determine what their interaction energies are. So how, um, how strong or not is that adhesion? So that J, okay, that J depends on the types. Um, so, for example, like cell nine and three, we colored here into purple, so that will, that would be of the same class of type. So they will have a certain uh, matrix J purple purple and J purple green, right? Okay, so we have so we can put biological different biological parameters in here depending on types, and zero uh, usually is reserved for medium. So that would be a cell which isn't a biological cell because it doesn't have a volume constraint; it's just stuff but there will be an interaction of interface between cell and medium. Okay, uh, so the algorithm itself then will, you know, it will randomly pick uh, a site, three. So this is, this is one, one piece of this cell number three uh, membrane. And it's going to randomly choose a neighbor in which you can copy into. So three is gonna copy into five. Ah, and here I did something wrong with my, with a LaTeX, so you can see this here. But basically, then it's going to ask the question. Uh, can I? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. So it's going to ask the question: What happened with the configuration before and after that attempt of copying? And it'll compare the energy. So if the energy decreased, it will always accept that change. And if it increased, there will be uh, a Boltzmann. Uh, distribution probability of accepting it. So the higher this increase in energy, the, the more unlikely it is to accept it. Um, but this depends on the, the, the temperature of your simulation. So you can make these unlikely events happen more or less frequently. Okay, so that's the Monte Carlo algorithm. And the way this looks like, I have to wait, I think a little bit because my computer is very slow, is, um, I'm going to show you a simulation just with, uh, here we go, with, um, so these red cells are individual cells. They're all of the same type, so they don't really adhere more or less strongly with one another. So they all do it in the same way. Um, and you see these fluctuations happening. That's this Monte Carlo algorithm happening in the background. Um, but what you can see is that although there's nothing in this program explicitly saying, you know, you have to be rounded or you have to be a hexagon, this is something that emerges, obviously, because you have an effective surface tension, which is being minimized, right? So, so this is a result. And, um, and this is what, what um, uh, Thompson was saying back then when he, when he was talking about cells can be seen at first instance as something which is minimizing, you know. Um, surface tension, and that's why tissues have these properties that we that we recognize in many uh, physical systems. Now, here to the right is the same simulation. The only thing I'm plotting here is we're plotting the where the fluctuations are happening over time, over a certain window. And the reason I want to show you this is because you can see that you can appreciate that all the angles are very continuous. You know, the very it's very curved. You don't really see the grid, so you do not see any more. The, the fact that we have discretized this, this problem, right? So, so we have all the possible continuous angles that, that one would expect. Okay, uh, let me just close this and then we can continue. So that was a cellular POTS model to describe cell surface mechanics. Now, these cells are way more complicated and, and I'm not gonna show you everything we've been doing along the years, but our, 
our mission is basically to take the cellular passport and make it more complicated by understanding if things are now skewing um, that cell internally, how does the cell look like? So, so those are big questions we ask. But for the plants, it got really complicated because for the plants, we noticed these pavement cells I showed you uh, on the epithelium of leaves. They have many of these, uh, these we call them lobes. So there are these regions where they extend outwards. And, and biologically, what's happening behind the scenes here is that inside the cell, you have certain uh, proteins, which they like to cluster together, like these red things here, okay? So it's called ROB2, so rows of plants. They don't, don't worry too much about the nomenclature, but, you know, they cluster there. And they cluster in, in different spots. And in between those red spots, you're going to get green spots, ROB6. And both of them are really important to be active. So you can't just do this just with the red spot, or you can't just do this just with the green spot. You need both of these interspersed spots of red and green, of these two uh, categories of proteins. And they will signal, in this case, the actin, uh, so, so which, are, which are these structures in the, in the um, well, the monomers which polymerize and they make these little, uh, yeah, these little like sticks, which, which start poking out. They make them uh, polymerize to the lobe, right? And that's super important for that lobe to, um, to make the cell wall a little bit, uh, to, to lessen the yield of the cell wall so it can extend okay so so this uh these plant cells are under a lot of trigger pressure and so it extends where where you where you have a concentration of actin branching um at the same time where you have these uh green spots you have these indentations you get formation of microtubuli that make like belts which go around that cell and they hold that part of this of the cell back so it it, it allows it not to expand so it makes it form these necks okay so these indentations Okay, so there's a lot of people, you know, thinking about how does the mechanics of this work? <laughs> it's, it's super easy to ver verbally talk about it, but, you know, how, how does it actually work is, is a really difficult problem mechanistically. But my problem, even before that, is like, how do these red and green spots form, right? So, so, so how do you get that break of symmetry? Um, and, and for that, it's quite nice because these these proteins, they actually can be turned on, which is like GTP bound. So basically where you have the yellow star, it's, it's doing its stuff. It's doing its signaling, it's on, and it can be deactivated again. So it's like a switch. You can turn it on and off, on and off, on and off, without having to uh, use up that protein. Um, however, it does that when it's, when it's on, the, on the membrane. So it's inserted in the membrane. So it diffuses around this membrane, but it doesn't diffuse very fast. Now, when it is in the membrane, it can also be taken into the cytosol, which would be the more liquid internal space of the cell. And there, because it's in the liquid, it's not in a membrane, it diffuses faster, okay? So, so this is the property. We have something that turns on and off on the membrane, but it can also sometimes be in the off state, it can also be diffusing faster in the, in the cytosol. And, and every single problem we look, we approach, which have these, uh, which have these protein families, they have different interactions, so they have different networks. So ROP2 is actually inactivating ROP6. ROP6 does some stuff, which then in its turn inactivates ROP2. So we have these feedbacks between them. Okay. Um, you know, the point of the talk is not to concentrate on the feedback, but sort of like the logical process of, of what we do and, and, and the cool things that we see, which I hope you can see, you'll, you'll appreciate soon. So we write, first of all, we we just look at the network of interactions, just the like ordinary differential equation part of it. So we have the, um, the rate of change of the active ROP2, which would be the guys in the lobes, the rate of change of the active ROP6 and, uh, and, and what it's doing, RIC1. Um, so ROP6 is activating this other guy, RIC1. Okay, so we can, we can write these things down. Um, we put, because we, we prefer actually to have two ordinary differential equations just for purposes of making all clients and, and being able to, to, to visually see things better. So we, uh, we assume quasi-steady state dynamics for RIC1, and then we, uh, we can reduce this, this system into two equations, which we were pretty happy with, uh, given the, the, the biological assumptions. Um, and if you look here at a bifurcation diagram, here, sorry, where the parameter which is activating, um, which is, I'll show you, I'm sorry, just very difficult here on my, my screen. So we have this A parameter here, this is auxin. So this is just something which is uh, activating um, both ROP2 and ROP6. If we vary this, so that's the x-axis here, what we see is that we will have um, a low equilibrium um, 
con uh, concentration here for ROP2 and then a high equilibrium concentration for ROP2. And there's this intermediate small, very small zone in which you have bistability, in which you have both a low equilibrium and a high equilibrium, right? Same thing we get for ROP6. And in the very early days, I'd just like to tell the story because it, it, it was a flaw in our thinking. We thought that, well, if we have these different patches, maybe we need to explore uh, regimes where we have bistability, where we have either a patch of high ROP2 and you can get somewhere else a patch of low ROP2, right? So that would be necessary. But screening for bistability is not the same thing as looking for polarity, right? So this is the, this is a, you know, a, a a big story behind this. Basically, screening for polarity is, is more or less just going to tell you, you know, will the whole cell be in a high state or a low state? It doesn't say that you'd have these patches uh, coexisting. So for us to understand will these patches coexist, we, we actually uh, started uh, using something which we developed during my PhD called local perturbation analysis. Um, so it's not perturbation theory, it's, it's quite different. But what we use here, what's really key here, is to assume that the inactive form of these uh, proteins, they, they diffuse much, much faster than the active ones, which is uh, a valid assumption. But we actually go to the extreme that they um, go infinitely fast. Oh, and I don't show these equations, which is really sorry. But please uh, take a look at um, these papers where we describe how, how we do this. And and this paper here, um, we're not an author of it. I'm just trying to get this stuff out of the way here. For sure, in um, here, Siam, Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems, he goes through a very rigorous study of it. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Okay. But basically, what we use with the local uh, perturbation analysis, when we make this assumption that the inactive is going infinitely fast and the active is actually not diffusing at all, we can go to this uh, limit where we can, um, again, just uh, just look at um, ordinary differential equations. Although we're looking at the spatial um, issue, can, um, can you have a different local uh, equilibrium if the global equilibrium is something else? Okay. And this is what we see here in this new uh, portrait here. So this is the bifurcation diagram. This is oxen again. Now what, what we see is that instead of just having one lower branch and one higher branch here where we had uh, and this intermediate by stability, we get these other branches appearing. Okay, and these here tell you that a local um, that a local uh, equilibrium would be possible. Okay, so let me explain this a little bit better. So if we have low oxygen concentration, so we're around here, we only have a homogeneous equilibrium possible. So this this cell would never, never, even if you give it perturbation, spatial perturbations, it would never be able to polarize. So this is what we see here. This is a space and time. Uh, diagram. Now, if you give it a sufficiently large local perturbation, so you sometimes it has to be actually really quite big, but 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 it can be uh, focal, focal, uh, focused in space. Um, so you go over this line here, you actually are able to then suddenly get a patch in that membrane which has a high amount of ROP2, like this much, okay? And that will actually extend, but it doesn't grow further due to something called wave pinning. Um, and so we can go through this thing and actually around here is also a Turing bifurcation, which explains why you at a certain moment when you make oxen higher and higher, you start actually getting these periodicities of many, many spots appearing. Okay, but now this is the technique that we use, we can screen any network and very easily come to the conclusion, you know, would it be able to present uh, by stability or, or not? It doesn't mean that it will, because in the end of the day, we have to do the simulations with the correct diffusion. Uh, coefficients to see if it, if it holds or not, but it gives you at least the, the, the regime in which it could happen. Okay, so now let me show you how these things look uh, in, I'm not going to say in real life, like in better than real life, so in simulation. So this is the same um, equation that I just showed you before, and it just takes a little bit of time to, to put it up. Um, and here we go. So this is just these are just the concentrations of we're looking at ROP2. Mm -hmm. Are you not starting? Um, so, so we have now the partial differential equation. So what you're going to see is the, the active concentration of ROP2. Oh, here it goes. Okay. So, so you see it starts with these, uh, there's a little bit of noise, you have these patches and suddenly you get these red spots. So these are high, high concentrations of ROP2 where you have blue, you have low concentrations of of ROP2 and conversely, I'm not showing it, but you'd have the high concentrations of ROP6, which is the antagonist. Um, 
and this is actual time so 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 we, we scale these things to like how big a, a cell would be you know we can use a precise diffusion rate so, so we have a good feeling about the and, and the kinetic rates of, of activation deactivation of these molecules so, so we can talk about time pretty well so this is here um hours day no yeah, this is seconds minutes hours and days at a certain moment the pattern goes it, it starts uh moving very slowly but but it nevertheless it moves in a way that it's starting to reduce the interface between, in this case, you'd see red and blue, right? Um, and if you wait long enough, in the case of this perfectly circular uh, cell, although it starts as having many multiple foci points, many red islands, that will all come together and in the end, the cell is just gonna have one big red front and one blue front back, right? So it doesn't look if you wait long enough, it doesn't look very asimilar to these normal cells that have a front and a back. I forgot to tell you that, but many, many animal cells have a front and a back. Okay. However, that same set of equations, when we, when we run them just with a different boundary condition, right? So uh, it's just wobbled. We just took this from a confocal image. What happens is they, they actually get trapped into these lobes because to overcome this lobe, because there's a no flex boundary conditions, these isoclines are always, ending up there with 90 degrees because you know there's no diffusion out and so the, the the local curvature would be so big that local curvature effects drives it to to uh, to straighten out and you, you get trapped so so those red spots cannot move around they cannot merge um so we thought it was pretty cool because we see that although as a biologist you think these small g proteins their patterns they shape the cell what we see is the shape of the cell also will uh will determine how those patterns move themselves. So we start to have a feedback between that. And um, because of these sort of simple simulations, we can do cool things also in the lab, which is like people can start now changing purposefully the shape of cells to see what happens to the patterns inside them. So now we see that the patterns inside them are not only guides, they're not just the masters, but they're also the slaves of the shape itself. Okay. So, so, so that's just an interesting way of, of creating a different hypothesis in, in biology using, um, you know, using these principles that we see here. So, um, okay, so shape. One thing about shape is that it's, it's highly important, not just for cells, but for anything in biology. So, so going back to Thompson, he also was saying that you could explain how you go from one species to another. So he took like fish species here, and this is like how the field of evo devo has evolved, so evolution and development. And, and the way he did it was super cool. He would just draw the fish, like he would put these blocks, and then he'd distort the blocks, make some type of transformation, just draw them by hand, you know, following that transformation. And, you know, oh, and this fish here looks exactly like Strenoptix diaphana, right? So he could do different types of transformations to get, for example, this species into that species. So what he was saying here is that um, evolution works by transforming shapes. Um, probably the developmental reason for that is that you have morphogen gradients and you have processes of growth and, and these parameters are being adjusted in such a way that you, know, you, you can do these uh, continuous uh, changes. So we also wanted to look at transformation of shape. And, and the way we, we started looking at that was we started generating a mutants um, of cell shape by, for example, changing the amount of auxin. I just showed you that auxin was a bifurcation parameter which could change the ability of a cell to make more or less lobes. So we made like, um, <laughs> this is really terrible. We, we had to make these mutants where the production of auxin would be, would be lowered. And then we got cells which didn't have that many lobes. So we really got this thing that we could see in that, that bifurcation that you would, um, you would not have the ability to make, you know, to go through that, uh, um, uh, um, th that point where many spots are formed. Okay, so so we, we generated a series of of different mutations, and we were looking at the shapes. But the problem then was we could really identify with the eye. This shape is different. The shape is bonky. The shape is weird, right? But it was very difficult to describe it mathematically. So how do you pinpoint what it is in the shape that has that has changed, and how can you quantify how much different is one shape to another? So we, we first wanted to, to retrieve all the shapes from the images. So this is, a, this is an experimental image. And I don't know if this is a movie or just the... Um, so we developed a segmentation method, which is based on the cellular POTS model. So I showed you the cellular POTS model as a method of... Um, is, this, is this going to work? Uh, oh, this is just clicking. Okay. But basically, sorry. So we come from this to... 
this is going to give you guys a headache yeah so it doesn't show the the full simulation but what happens is that um we feed the confocal image into into our program and it will then um seed many little uh cellular pots model cells on top of that picture now the, with the difference that now the energy of the cells will also interact with the confocal image so it doesn't want to grow over uh, where you have signal of the of cell membrane and what happens over time is that they start to coalesce those cells and we can get in the end if we wait long enough with the simulation we will get one cpm cell filling the space of where a biological cell should be so this is a way of segmenting which is not uh it, it's um it, it's using the stochastic nature of the cpm but it's also using the fact that there's some information on cell surface mechanics and it works really well for for a large variety of cells without you having to change parameters so this is basically what we use now we call it the segmentation uh, pots model um and this allows us to 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 collect from images you know to digitalize the contour of many many cells so we segment them and that brought us to a, a second problem let me just see how i'm going with time okay so just given time i'm just going to briefly go through this um for for whoever wants to know more about it please please contact me or look at the articles but what we do here is then we realize that um Right, let me take this out of the way. So, for example, if we look at these, if we look at these cells here, um, D, E, F, and G, right? Um, in the literature, the the type of quantifications that biologists were using and publishing and documenting between different lines or different uh, mutants, they um, they would usually be one number, one or two numbers. Okay, and these numbers were um, very uh for us very unsatisfactory to, to to describe something as complex as these shapes so but things that they were looking at was average length of lobes so people would actually measure by hand the the absolute distance of the lobes right um and you know it, it doesn't it doesn't lead you anywhere you can see like this cell here would be very similar to that cell which which, which i don't know um also it doesn't really grasp the idea of shape because you know cells can be bigger or smaller and that would very much change these 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 metrics I mean, this was a really really bad metric but you, you can't imagine how how many papers were, were used to quantifying using this then there was something else that people use like form factor aspect ratio but which is basically looking just at the area and the perimeter and and for many many things it's it's good enough but it's definitely not good enough when shapes become more complex as you can see here for example form factor of these two cells are the same but it's very different like this is much more elongated uh, this one has more like a, a smaller puzzle uh, jigsaw shape. So, so this is like we would think about it more as a mutant, this one not, you know. So, so these are phenotypes that we, we understand as a human, but we wouldn't be able to get with these type of numbers. Um, there were other things that people were doing, like using algorithms to strip down uh, the perimeter until you can come to a skeleton and then just counting the number of skeleton ends. What we saw there, it's like highly dependent on the resolution of the picture you take and also on the parameters of the algorithm. So it, it, it could give you anything actually. So, so all of these methods we thought were, were, were very bad. And, and again, I think it's sort of philosophical, the fact that you're going from like a higher dimensional space to a lower dimensional space, you're always gonna lose something. But so the question we were asking ourselves, what were we okay with losing and what did we want to keep? So, um, so we looked at Fourier decomposition for, for uh, describing the contour uh, through a Fourier decomposition. Um, the problem is that when you have non-holomorphic uh, shapes, like what we do for pavement cells, for different angles, you would get different points, right? Different distances. So you wouldn't really have a, a function there. Um, so what you use instead is called the elliptic Fourier analysis. So that then you actually take the X and Y, um, and then you can, um, you can solve it out in this in this series. Um, and that was indeed what people had been doing when we looked in the field more of you know what what mathematicians and, and people who were quantifying shape were using, they were using a Fourier decomposition for non-holomorphic shapes or more complex shapes. Um, so determining the, the coefficients is uh, of that matrix is done like this. Um, and I, I like to remind people, you know, what does it mean to sum up ellipses? Because that's what you're doing at the end of the day. You know, it's a little bit like this, this spirograph. I, I don't think I have to show the movies to you guys, but this is, this is a biological cell. We decompose them. So we will have a first ellipse, which is basically going to give you the, uh, did I, am I wrong? Which will basically give you the main axis of your shape, right? So this is, uh, 
the principal components of that shape. Then you sum the second uh, ellipse, which is going to rotate once around the first. Um, the second, can I? Okay, so this is the, the second ellipse rotates, but there's going to be a point rotating around it, and the trace it leaves behind is now approximating each time more closer the shape of the real cell of the series. Then that's the third ellipse. The third ellipse is going to rotate twice around the second, while you know, you're going to trace three times uh, around that. And it's very important here, are you tracing counterclockwise or, or, or clockwise, right? So that would, that would alter the, the trace that you're leaving behind. So, so that's a little bit the problem of the elliptic Fourier analysis. It ends up that there are many, many representations, there are many, many ellipses, which will give you in the end of the day, depending on where you start, your initial starting point is, how your rotations are, which will give you the same shapes. So when you do this um, decomposition, it's, it's not a unique decomposition. You could get different, different uh, decompositions. So what we then had to do because we couldn't compare ourselves. People have been doing statistics using elliptic Fourier analysis and getting very, very strange results because of this issue, which, which hadn't been flagged. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the detail. We actually had to move to a different basis, which will give you a unique representation of the shape. So now for any type of rotation or inversion, it's, all, you know, it, it's going to hold. Um, it basically consists of taking your lips and decomposing them into two, uh, two circles, counter, uh, one rotating counterclockwise, the other clockwise. And then we had to mix up these, uh, these amplitudes in a different way. And what we get here is we call it the local effort. So this is, a, this, this is our fancy elliptic Fourier. But basically the amplitude, so this was the power. So we call it the, the local number. So here we have the harmonic. So this would be the first harmonic, you see. What it gives you now is going to be exactly, for example, how, how big your radius is. So now you actually have a, a measure. And six will be the mode at which it will have its next high uh, contribution. And that's because this shape here has six points. So now by looking at the spectrum, you can really say, OK, I know how big this, uh, this, this shape is, the cell is. And I know here six, that it's going to have six protrusions. Moreover, by looking at this quantitative value of the six, you know how far those protrusions are. Okay, so these are for simple shapes. Um, so we're just proof of principle showing that you can, you can use this now to quantify protrusions and shapes and geometrical shapes. You can also use this new method to look at the amplitude of those protrusions, but you can also now use this to look at more complicated shapes. We'll have a, a sum of different uh, frequencies. Right. And so it works very well for us to to even to look at these spectra and understand what the shape is. But it works like a charm for the computer to be able to understand shapes and to to do um, um, principal component analysis, but also to do like if, if you want to put this into some artificial intelligence type of program. And I'm going to show you another thing that. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm going to jump this out of, uh, out of time. We just modified the solar parts model so we can also introduce uh, shape variations in them. And then we could put this together into uh, in silico tissues to see the shapes um, having to readapt because they're being, uh, they're in tessellation. And we could use the local EFA, which is a quantification method to be able to um, look at what is the variation of shapes that you get in the simulations. So we could start doing some, some funny things there because we had this, this new way of, of looking at shapes. Let's go back to the real uh, biology. So this is, again is the leaf of the, the problem I'm showing you of the Arabidopsis. This is an actual image, right? Um, within the development of the leaf, not all cells are already looking like this cool. They start off quite, um, you know, quite boring, quite geometric. And as oxygen levels go up and they mature, they can start, you know, getting those spots and they start um, um, having those protrusions. And sometimes you have protrusions on top of protrusions. So it just gets more and more and more complex as the leaf grows and the cells age at the tip. Um, and so with this new statistical method, we have something really, really strong that we can now discriminate between, um, between, for example, wild type and, and different mutants of, 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 the, of that network that I've been showing to you. And moreover, we can ask questions like, look, I, I give you a cell computer, tell me what, what would be the mutant this is most similar to. So it can do these type of things. Right? So we're very happy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop looking at this. Now, the, the cool thing, and this is where we are at this stage, is um, the local EFA, because, because it has this unique representation for a shape, it can also, over time, as the shape 
changes in a in a leaf so the, this come these come from experiments in which we were looking at the same leaf over several days so we're taking pictures 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 and then the student identifies this cell over different times right so this is not to scale of course the cell is much bigger in the end i'm just we're just showing the shape here of that same cell and this would be the the local alpha spectrum of that so as you see as time progresses in in this z direction inwards you get many more peaks developing so showing you this this incremental polarity which is happening um, but the nice thing is from one time point to another so in the beginning we took it every six days and afterwards every uh, six hours and afterwards every 12 hours um, what we see is that they're, they're pretty much similar you know cells don't like overnight morph into a, a totally different shape you know they progressively change from 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 a to g so we could now use this method to track cells back because this is one of the most painstaking things to do when you're looking at biological images uh, of, of time series it's to be able not just to segment segment we could do with segmentation plus model as i explained to you but to say which of that segmented cell was the previous segmented cell in the previous picture and so forth so how do you interlock them and so the way this works is basically the computer would take like a, like this cell here and then it would say okay what, which is the next in the next time point which was the cell which was most uh similar to it and it identifies it as the first match because those local alpha coefficients are very similar right these are other candidates which were less less good but which had similar you know would have been like second third and fourth candidates mm -hmm. so in this way you can you know you can do some triangulation beginning you, you can get some you can mark some either does it by the local f or not and it starts finding back by itself second iteration who the cell so this green cell it knows was this green cell this pink cell it knows was this pink cell this purple cell it knows was this purple cell um note that because there's a lot of growth in these leaves and we and the position of the tissue changes there's no way of using xy coordinates right so you really have to go by eye or, or, or by you know the width or, or using the local effort you have to go by uh by key signatures of the of the of the shape um, it also is able to, and this is what we, the, the program does, it's also able to understand that if these two cells at the next time, if, if you would add that shape up together, you would get that shape previously. So it is then able also to, to get the divisions, right, through this algorithm. So it's able, it, you know, it, it's, it's not very difficult to, to write something like this, but it's very, it's very nice because now we can not only identify the cells, but we can also track divisions, for example, okay and um and growth rates and growth tensors so this is just for you guys to see like this was one experiment that took 15 days and it went all the way to, to all of these cells so we got all the life histories of these cells you know when were they born how did they divide where did they divide you know um how was the shape how how much time was it in between them and when you have such big amount of data you can start making hypotheses you can start asking the question well how is the regulation of a leaf uh, growth happening you know when what, what are the basic rules for a cell to divide or not does it depend on their size on their location in the in the leaf and so forth so you can query all these questions against the data that you have so so this is one of the things we do a lot um so we had forty thousand uh cells attract um we got together with another biologist uh, who was looking a lot into this rico cohen and we were because of this type of tracking data we were able then to make uh simulation models that i'm not going to talk about and compare them to experiments where we were actually changing certain um certain aspects of the growth and we could see how do these rules then hold you know are we able to recreate the the leaf shape or not using simple individual agent-based uh rules okay I see back to I only have like five minutes, maybe, or should I just stop because because okay, I'll just I'll just continue if nobody protests, but it'll just just four minutes. So the next thing is, although shape is so important, we we decided to to forget about it um, also and just think about topology of cells um, because because uh, Wentworth Thompson, he also said that, okay, although um, you know the, the topology could be explained by something as simple as minimizing uh, surface tension and the type of neighbors you would expect to have like in a honeycomb if if cells are not able to change neighbors and that is the case of plants but they are dividing and they have different division planes the topology so how many neighbors you have is a result of how you divide and how your neighbors divide it so it's not that much surface tension it's more a question of um of life history of divisions 
And so we started because we had this data, we just, we were just curious to take a look what, what's happening with topology in this system, which has such strange shapes. So white here shows you all the cells which have six neighbors, the boundary we couldn't really uh, quantify because they have they are boundaries, so they have no neighbors outside. Um, in these colors, six, eight, nine, so these blue colors, we have uh, neighborhoods uh, higher than six and here um, lower than six, okay? And we were comparing the, the same leaf over time and trying to see, do we see something in this, in the topology distribution? We couldn't see much except that, of course, the mid vein, which is this part here where you have because of their uh, longer shape. And when we looked at these distributions of uh, number of neighbors and the frequency of that distribution to happen is my, is, is are you guys listening? Okay. Um, we saw that for old and a new leaf, they were very similar, which amazed us because there are many more divisions that have occurred. So what we decided to do is um, we also compared younger cells with older cells. They had the same type of distribution, which was also very strange. Um, we did compare um, the, the distribution with other species. And what we noticed, Arabidopsis, so this, is, this, this blue line is ours, is very different than others. So it has actually, although it has a peak at six, it's a very, it's a much lower peak at six. So it's not as well behaved. It's not as honeycomb-like as you would expect. Okay. And the other one which gets somewhat close to it is another plant tissue, but all the other type of species are, are far away. And we were wanting to ask I wonder, we were wondering why, why is that the case? So we made a model, which is a topological model, where we now just take uh, into account the graph representation of those of cells, right? So you have cells with their neighbors here, which are the edges. And each time you will uh, divide a cell, you're going to create here, um, for example, here you're going to create another node, right? Which will be the new cell, and then they're going to be new edges. Okay, so, so, so that's what's happened. Now the question is, what are the divisions? What are the rules of division? So we don't have shape here, it's just topology really. But we can talk about um, cells wanting to divide in such a way that after the division, the mother and daughter cell will have um, equal or very close to equal number of neighbors. So they're gonna divide through their topological middle. It could be random so that this new cell wall which is being formed you know, it just chooses a, it just chooses here an edge and it goes to any one of them with equal probability. So it's random, it doesn't care. So in this case here, one, the daughter cell is only gonna have three neighbors while the mother would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? So something very asymmetric. Or what we would say that we call the Pascal rule is that there's a tendency to do it more towards the middle, an equal split, but then you'd have this probability of it doing it less for, for more, more unequal, uh, uh, splits. And so this is a simulation, just a topological simulation, and you let it run for some time and it actually uh, reaches uh, some type of homostasis. And so those are the distributions we plot here. And what you see is that the equal rule, which is the blue one, falls exactly on top. It's the only one which is, which is close, but it's exactly on top of our Arabidopsis data. So suddenly our Arabidopsis data for, for the leaf that we thought was such an anomaly, so weird, it is actually mimicking or, or, or it's, it's not mimicking, it's, um, it, it's able to be um, reproduced by the most simple primitive topological model, which, which assumes an equal, uh, equal split rule. So we couldn't believe that this was true, like, you know, because sometimes you can have things that match, but it doesn't mean that that's exactly what's happening. But then we remember that we do have the tracking data, right? So we do know this cell divided, that gave rise to these two. So we could go through all the tracking of the divisions we had and ask the question, what happened to the neighborhood of mother and daughter cell after tracking? So these are the matrices, mother, uh, daughter and mother cell um, at, um, after division. Um, what happens to them? So the equal split rule would, would be giving you these probabilities here along the, this diagonal. Um, and the random split gives you something which, which is much more equally distributed like this between the type of mother and daughters that it's going to generate. Um, and our data, and then we have the, the Pascal, and our data actually was very, very similar to the equal split rule. In fact, some of the smudging that it had was because of um, um, divisions that it missed, because sometimes there were two divisions in, in, in two pictures. So we saw that uh, the assumption that cells divide through the middle give you that topological um, spectrum, and that the rule that they divide through the top of the topological middle, we could actually track it back in the data. Now, 
Now, as a biologist, does it mean that cells have a mechanism of understanding how many neighbors they have and that they divide in a way to keep that neighbor distribution the same? We don't know because it's, it's not even clear how, how cells send shape, for example. But, um, but I was, you know, th this came from discussions with, uh, with Alan Champies. He was talking, because I, I told him about this, he was talking about tents, and then uh, it, it occurred to us that in tents, indeed, you have these, you have the pegs, and that's where the tensions are on. So you might have a very highly complex shape, but the distribution of, of, of pegs can be a bit different. And you can imagine that a cell has these, uh, these points, uh, these triple points where it may, has its neighbors. So it knows where the neighbors are in, in contact with it, and it divides in a way that it, keeps the pegs equal from one side to another. So, so there might be some, so, something there. That was the end of what I wanted to talk and the, the clock also told me off. So, so thank you to, to everybody. And if someone is still around, I'd be really happy to ask her to get questions. Thanks, Veronica. It was great talk. Uh, I can uh, see the monks. I see, I see the chat now. I can see the monks. Shouldn't we be hit? <laughs> well, uh, so any questions? A lot of things I talked really quickly over. So, so if, if you want me to, so don't don't worry if you think yeah. you didn't get it or just just yeah. Yeah. So it was quite intensive. It's true. Um, so I, there are, well, we don't have much time for for questions, but if you get back to so I have a question. Thank you, question. Uh, if you get back to this movie where you were modeling this. Are they called the ROP2, ROP6 model? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when you were talking about polarization, you meant distribution of this ROP2, ROP6 yeah, so inside, I, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So the asymmetric distribution, distribution of, of those molecules, we know is the first, first thing which unleashes like um, polar responses. Uh, okay. Uh, well, at least when, when it was circular, it was clear that you have two two sides for circular shape. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is the thing. So, so a lot of times in polarity, I mean, we have, we have models where you only get a front and a back, like yeah. traditional polarity. But you have, um, you have cells that can have multiple fronts, this right? This one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so generally, as I understood, the idea of this ROP2, ROP6 model was to illustrate this change of shape, this, this pavement yeah. shape. So this would mean that Rope, so this, uh, this, so you have pattern concentration pattern for rope to rope six, which affects shape, and then maybe shape affects rope to rope six. So yeah. generally, this, I mean, to go far one step up, probably you would check it using, for example, uh, solar pots model to, to have yeah, this so, impact so, on both so, sides. Yeah, so, so we have work, uh, me and Stan, that we, we work together on a model. Um, with animal cells, which I haven't talked about here, where we have a similar uh, like partial differential network, right? Working yeah. in the cell, in the cytosol. And it forms a pattern, why is this not working? It forms a pattern, but that pattern actually creates biased forces uh, mm -hmm. for, um, for pixels to move outwards or inwards. So yeah. you, can get, you can get, as a result, you can get a moving cell and you can get a cell changing shape, right? But that's because we, we, we based then parameters on, because we had actin in that model. So we could think about actin concentrations at the, at the plasma membrane and what type of forces that would generate on that patch of membrane. So we used uh, work by um, the, 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 the actin ratchet uh, models by Alex McGillner for that, right? So we could parameterize. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, we could link intracellular patterning to shape. We can't really do that that well for plant cells okay, yeah, um, because plant cells, they, they change shape in a very different way. First of all, they grow and they, the mechanics is, is totally different. So, so the point I make here is more like, okay, forget, forget that, we know this is unrealistic, forget the shape change, but let's just see what would happen if you would have a, a cell which is not moving, but has a different shape to begin with. And then you can see the impact of the shape on top of the pattern. But, but you're totally right, Bhakti, that the, the link, the feedback, uh, the dynamical feedback is missing here because we don't know how to, how to implement that. Yeah, and how you explain, so it, it, it looks to be frozen for quite a while in the middle. Why, it, so this. Now? No, no, not now. 
So somewhere in the middle, in like first minute, first. Oh start. yeah, yeah. So 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 the time dynamics. Yeah. So the time dynamics of these curves are very interesting. In the beginning, the curves are much more. They're smaller, so they're more curved. So there's a um, th th there's a greater tendency to change. So it, the velocity is bigger. So now as it starts becoming time. bigger and bigger in size, the curvature gets uh, gets smaller, and it's going to slow down, right? Nevertheless, and then accelerates again, yeah, for some reason. Huh? Then accelerates again a bit late. What well, now it's frozen, but then it will start. Oh, big, big, okay. Big. There's another thing the simulation here because it yeah. gets so boring. At a certain moment, I just fast forward the simulation so you can see ah, down here in the clock. Okay. okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There's nothing magical like, oh, that would be really cool. Like if there's like a phase transition. No, no, no. That, that, that's just like, okay, we can't wait that long. Uh, we just fast forward the, the, the movie. Okay. Great. We made the frames less. Yeah, this year, this That's year, yeah. Good. So this is no, just, you know, <laughs> it, it was getting so slow. We had to, we had to change the, the visualization. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because, it, but, but you see, it does, it does do it. So even here, yeah. you know, very slowly, it's still going to shift. So, and yeah, it so approaches so that straight line slowly, right? But okay. It is interesting. Okay. Uh, so. I have more questions, but maybe I will ask them later. So now yeah. this, it, it went too long. Yeah. S thank you, Veronica. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for mm -hmm. thinking.